Ronnie Dahl, for wheeling at westernaustralia.com and welcome to my new electrical setup. So in this video, you're gonna get a comprehensive look at what's in here, what it does, why I chose to put it in, or why I've done it the way I've done it, and how it's actually wired in. And then at the end of the video, I'll do a quick little segment on my thoughts after a 10 day trip with this new current setup. So stay tuned. So as you can see, I'm at PDP, where I did most of the work myself. So it's all DIY stuff here. There are a couple of components that I uh, got a bit of help with, um, also got a lot of advice with it. So there's a lot of corners I used to cut, which I haven't cut this time. And this being a permanent setup, I wanted it to look nice and neat and all the wire hidden behind panels. But I'll get to more of that later. Now, as far as tips and hints, uh, and you know, on soldering and crimping and all the other stuff that you need to know for DIY if you're not sure how to do it. That'll be in a separate video. And the reason for that is because this video is gonna be long enough as it is. So this video will give you a good insight as to why and how things work and why they're in there, what they do. And then you can work out if it's something that you need or if it's something that you don't need. So we'll start at the front of the vehicle because that is where I have made a bit of a change to my battery setup. Okay, so here we are at the front and as I said earlier, I'm gonna break it down into steps. So you're gonna get the Ronnie version of what's going on. Two cranking batteries now. Now before I had a cranking battery and a deep cycle battery, which sent power to the rear, which had an isolator and it was using the BCDC. Now, it's just two cranking batteries. So why have I done it? Okay, winching is a big amp drill and a compressor. It's also a big amp drill, especially when you run a twin compressor. But look, it's not really that much of an issue to warrant having two batteries in parallel, but I just like to have it because I have done a lot of night runs and the amount of draw on the power is quite big when you've got all your lights on and then you're winching because it's all stuck and I have um, dropped a cell before on a battery and I believe it was due to the fact of that. So now I have two batteries uh, with way more amp hours of power. How do you make it a parallel battery? One battery. Well, we get some starter cable and you run it from positive to positive, battery to battery, and then negative to negative. Now you have a giant battery. Rightio, so here is a diagram to make it crystal clear. You have battery one and battery two. To link them as parallel, you need to run a positive wire from positive terminal to positive terminal, and then from negative terminal to negative terminal. Now you have batteries in parallel. Now both of these batteries are 95 amp hours each. Once you link them as parallel, they become one big battery of 190 amp hours. So for what purpose would you do two cranking parallel batteries? Well, for high current draws. For example, winching, running twin compressors, and also running a lot of night driving lights. So if you have light bars, spotlights, rock lights, you got all of your lights on, they really do hit your batteries hard and your alternator may not be able to keep up. So from here, there are two wires that go to the back. So again, another diagram. The two parallel batteries on the front, you can see now, there are two wires that run to the back. The first wire, 80 amp wire will run to the twin air compressor. Side note, always run your compressor from your cranking batteries while the engine is running. Then separate to the air compressor, you have a third battery in the rear. Now that third battery is managed by a Red Arc Manager 30, a battery management system. The second wire coming from the parallel batteries goes to the BMS and then from there it will charge the battery in the back. And that is the power feed to charge the third battery, which is a house battery separate from these two. Welcome to the rear of the vehicle, the bit that you wanna see. Battery first. In here, that is a 105 amp hour AGM battery, absorbed glass matted battery. What that battery does is it powers everything on the back. The outside lights, the inside lights, the two fridges, the draw fridge, and the combi fridge, which is in here. Ta-da, there's a second fridge. So why did I choose an AGM battery? 
Well, for one, it's a deep cycle battery. A deep cycle battery tolerates uh, low current draws for a long period of time. So basically, you shouldn't be starting a vehicle off it. You shouldn't be running a compressor off it, which is why the compressor runs off the two front batteries. You shouldn't have any high amp drawage off that battery. Look, it can tolerate a bit, but not constant. Also, an AGM battery charges way quicker than your conventional lead acid battery, but not as quick as a lithium battery. Do I wish I had a lithium in here? Yes, I do. So how is it wired in? Okay, well, it's an independent battery sitting in the back here, but it's wired directly into the uh, BMS, the battery management system, which looks after the battery. So now let's jump to the BMS because you need to know what's going on here before we can talk about the rest of the stuff. But you also need to know before we get into the Manager 30, there are two solar panels on the roof. More on those later. The Manager 30 is a battery management system. The reason why it's called a Manager 30 well, is because it manages the battery and all charges and discharges going through it. And the 30 is for 30 amps. So it's able to throw 30 amps into your battery at any given stage or time. This unit here can charge your battery from solar, which I mentioned already, from the front alternator or the batteries from the front when they're charging through the alternator, this will de detect it through the wire that I explained earlier, which goes to the back to the manager 30. If the car is switched on, it'll draw 30 amps from the front. It doesn't just stop there. It's also AC compatible. So I can plug this into my household points at home in the garage and I can pre-charge my battery for a trip. Or say I'm leaving, leaving it there for a couple of days and not driving because I mainly use this for off-roading and trips, then I can keep my battery topped up and keep the fridges cold. And that is a massive bonus. Before, when I had the ARB fridge and just a basic setup, I had to unplug the fridge, put it into the AC point so that it wouldn't draw all the power from my battery to keep the fridge cold. Now, all I have to do, I can keep two fridges going, two fridges, look at this, plug it into the AC, and it'll charge the battery, which is really cool. What it also does is you get a display panel with it. It runs CAN bus, so it's, it's like a smart unit. It's like a computer system as well. It keeps tabs on the state of charge, tell you how long until flat or how long until full charged. Now, it always works on the worst case scenario. So if I start the vehicle up, it's gonna change from 16 hours to go flat to um, uh, one hour to go full. Also, it tells you how much power is coming in through your solar, through your AC, and through your vehicle charge from the front. And it even tells you how much draw is coming in amp-wise, and how much draw is coming out of the battery into your accessories. So if I switch more accessories on, I can actually see how much it's all drawing, which is really cool. It also logs everything, tells you the battery temperature. So it, it does a lot of stuff. You can actually learn a lot about your battery and your solar panels and, and all that stuff over the course of a year of using it. So if you travel a lot, you're gonna get a lot of information out of it. Now onto the solar panels. Two Red Arc 80 watt panels, totaling of 160 watts. So what do they do? Well, it's pretty obvious. They take power, or well, they absorb the, the sun's rays and then turn it into power, which is really cool. Uh, why did I choose solar panels? Because I think you're mad if you live in Australia and you don't have solar power. Uh, of course, unless you don't have a setup to run them, which I haven't had previously, or you don't have the money to buy them, obviously. So that is why I've, cho I've chosen these. And also I can camp up at a camp for a couple of days if I'm in the sun and then I'll, they'll keep my batteries topped up or uh, well, slow it down from draining pretty much. So you've got to have realistic expectations with solar panels. But although these are 80 watt panels, because they are fixed panels, they are not facing the sun directly. Um, so look, in summer, yeah, they're pretty much directly in the sun at midday, but as the sun you know, rises or sets, uh, it changes angles and you're not gonna get the full sun. So unless you have a panel you can tilt or shift, 
you're never going to get the full potential out of your panels. So another thing to keep in mind. So that is a 700 watt inverter. What does it do? Well, an inverter takes DC current and turns it into AC current. So basically, you can run your household items off the inverter. Anything with, with an AC plug, basically. So if you had a big enough one, you could run a hairdryer if you wanted to. So why did I choose to put an, an inverter in? Well, to charge my camera gear, because I have a charge box. I can put a whole charge box in there, plug it in, charge everything at the same time. So how is it wired in? Well, it comes straight off the battery, more or less, but then goes to a circuit breaker. Now the maximum amps this inverter can draw, from what I believe, is about 80, just over 80 amps. My circuit breaker is only 50 amps. So basically, it's not enough for that unit. However, that said, uh, once it gets over 50 amps of draw, this thing here will just trip like that. The reason why I haven't gone for an 80 amp circuit breaker is because I'm only charging camera gear. So essentially I could have got away with a 500 watt inverter or whatever, but it's a 700 watt, watt inverter nonetheless. Next thing on the list to talk about are the two fridges. They use power too. So each fridge will use 2.7 amps, the average high amount I believe they draw. So, having two fridges, why have I got two fridges? Well, this one here is on the road. Sandwiches, drinks, I can pull the table out, make my lunch. This one here is half freezer, half fridge. So it can keep my long-term food and for, it's for cooking. So more on that in stage five, which I've already covered. So that's all I'm gonna say here. But now onto how I've wired them in. This one here has a Deutsch plug on it. So I can uh, release it and, and pull it out and unbolt it, take it out if I need to. This one here, I have cut the um, fuse that came with the angle fridge and I've hardwired it straight in because I have two fuse panels here, 10 amp uh, fuse in this fuse panel. Of course, I can unplug the cord from the back of the angle fridge, so that's no drama. Something here that I think a lot of you guys are gonna appreciate is how I've done the wiring um, with the movement of the drawer. Now, there are a lot of people, when they pull their fridge out, they're worried about how they push them back in. They're usually holding a wire or something because they're worried about getting it jammed. I have CNC cabling underneath here, which you'll see on your screen now. So as I pull the drawer out, the CNC cabling track will move with the fridge out and with the fridge back in, keeping the wire safe. Now this wire I think, then goes underneath and then comes into behind this fuse panel here. My main panel that came out of the box, it's a removable panel. So I have then placed where I think everything's going to be in the best spot. So you get everything you're going to mount and you put it on your board. Uh, I suggest using masking tape, especially if, it's, if you're working with um, well, plastic or, or metal, this is aluminium and then that way you can mark on it and then when you drill and cut into it you're less chance of scratching your plate so if, regardless if it's painted or not I suggest you do this because it's going to look a lot prettier I've got my head torch out so you can see what we're looking at that there is where that big panel is going to go there's a bit of a recess here as you can see there behind here is another panel that's where I'm going to mount the inverter and for the um, battery management system I found the best place will be right here because then I'll be staring at it when I'm looking at it so that's how I've worked out where to put things and and here's the BMS the Red Arc BMS and that's going to live just in there because where my arm is right now, there's usually a drawer. Well, the drawer will be going back in. Okay, so now to all the lights and the switches. So on your screen now, you see the lights that are on the outside. The backs being 20 watts and the sides being 10 watts each. They are run from in here. These top switches will do those lights. These bottom two switches 
do the internal lights. That one there being a 9 watts light, which gives a nice white light. And then I have what some people call the party lights, red, blue, green strips. So I can change the, uh, the color on the lights. So why did I choose to have a multicolored light? Well, it's not just for fun and parties. It's so at night, I have a red light and then it's, you know, you keep your night vision better than if you had a yellow light but a yellow light is better than a white light when it comes to bugs. And then I have the white light as well for when I need to see what I'm doing because it gives me the most light. The other reason why I have chosen to go for a smart unit like this was to avoid running three different types of lights, red, yellow, and white, because it's triple the wiring, triple the, the work. Okay, so now to get slightly more complicated, uh, we're going to look at how everything is fused and wired and the circuit breakers and all that stuff. So for, for those auto sparkies who saw my previous video and commented on how messy it was, well, yeah, it was pretty damn messy, but it was a temporary box. This one here is a permanent box, so all the mess of wires is all hidden behind the panel, which I'm going to reveal to you after I show you what's on the front of the panel. Now we're further back, two fuse panels. These two fuse panels are pre-protected by this circuit breaker up here, 50 amp circuit breaker. So if I hit this, both my fridges are gonna turn off and everything in here that runs off here is gonna be turned off. Everything's off. To flick it back on, you simply just reset it. This was the other circuit breaker we already covered for the inverter here, the 700 watt inverter and that protects the cabling going directly to it. This is the other fuse panel. So as I said before, all the fuses in here correspond to where they need to go. So 10 amp fuses for the fridges, five amp fuse for the lights, you know, just all the appropriate sizes that are required for everything. And something you need to keep in mind is for these kind of ones here, uh, if you can go up to 20 amps fuse on, on, on these um, cigarette lighter plugs, I tend to stick to 10 or 15. I'll, I'll have one that's 15 for higher drawing items and one, keep one at 10. So that's what it looks like behind here. And this is why I suggest getting a panel which you can remove. Uh, and also it hides everything. So everything behind here is hidden. And most of these terminals here are just crimped, which is fine because they're going onto the back of these switches. So um, I don't see a need to heat shrink all those, but hey, if you want to be real professional about it, you could. So some of these wires run up in here and into this channel here. I specifically got this channel put in so I can run wires in here, and that's how that one there is powered. It has a wire directly in behind it. The CAN bus plug for the back of the Manager 30 is behind this panel here which comes out. So when you look at doing these things, just try and think ahead, think where you want things and then you know, ask your custom fabricator or whatever to put some channels in and tell them what they're there for. So behind this one over here, behind that there's a few more wires but they're all the wires coming in from outside which have grommets. So all the solar uh, power that comes in goes through a big grommet and then what, what they do is you tighten them up and they keep some water tight if you get the correct ones. So I've got IPE67s on the back and they'll keep all the moisture out. Now for the guys who are the keen DIYers who want to take on a job like this, uh, here's some extra advice on from my building experience with this. So not all tips and hints, but just advice on to take on a build like this. draw where you think you're going to put everything and I guarantee you you won't put everything where you think you're going to put everything because I didn't on this either. Then the next step lay everything on the ground and work out how much wire, fuses, things like that, all the componentry you need in between it all. Some of it's come from my old build and and whatnot. What I will talk about is the componentry that's in here. I estimate all the componentry in here like all the switches, the wiring, um, 
the solder, all that stuff. I estimate that to be about four to 500 Australian dollars. Please do factor that in if you go to do something like this. Expect a bit of wastage and expect a few componentry you bought extra you don't need. And look, you're better off getting too many than not enough because then you might start cutting corners and you don't want to cut corners. Switch panel is probably the main thing. Now, if I could go back and redo all this, I would have worked out where I'm gonna put everything on that panel before I got the box built, this custom box here, and I would have taken those measurements down to them. I said, I would have said, this panel, can I please have the panel cut in half for a start because then it's easier to work with. And two, I'll get all the holes pre-laser cut or plasma cut, whatever device they use. I had to cut every single hole myself and it's, like, it's a delicate procedure. If that's what you are going to do yourself as well, I would highly recommend putting masking tape over the panel and then you can slowly edge into it and cut the holes out. And also if you cover it with masking tape, you can draw on it and mark on it and you're not gonna mark the, um, the panel itself. So that, that's probably the main tip. Things get confusing when there's a lot of wires going on. Even if you have planned everything out and you've got everything on a drawing, there's wires going everywhere behind this panel. It's a freaking mess. So the best way to keep control on that is you do one switch at a time, one plug at a time, and on the back of it, you put some masking tape around that wire and you write on that masking tape what it's for. So if it's for your fridge, if it's for the light switch, or whatever it's for, then when you're rummaging around to try and connect everything up later, you know exactly which wire goes where and then you're not crossing wires and, and whatnot. This next bit of advice is something that I need to take into account for myself next time. And that is when you've hooked something up, before you close all the panels up and everything, check that it actually works first. I've had a couple of lights on here that didn't work because I mucked something up and I had to pull everything apart again and redo it. And that was because I did it at night in my driveway at home because I could only be at this workshop for a certain amount of time, right? Don't rush anything. So I'm kind of happy I did most of my stuff here at PDP because yeah, I could ask for advice at any stage. They would also encourage me every time or prevent me from taking shortcuts because there was a trip coming up and I needed to get this vehicle ready. They made me do it proper which I'm grateful for because otherwise I would have cut corners and then it would have been the old mindset, I'll do it when I get back and then you never do it because you're doing something else. Although I've done everything here DIY myself, there are some things that I asked the guys here to do for me because I'm not the best solderer. I, look, I can solder smaller wires, but when it comes to crimping terminals, you need a good amount of solder in there, it's got to be done proper. It has to be crimped proper with a big tool. Now most people are going to do a DIY job in their backyard, look, you may have a, a mate you can borrow the equipment off, but most of us aren't going to have that at home. So what I, what I do suggest is with your terminal wires or your thick wires, maybe go down to the shop and see if you can get them to actually crimp it and put the put the lugs on the end so it's pre-done. All you have to do is get the measurement right and get all the wires and terminals that you need and then you're pretty much ready to go. Everything else is quite easy once you get into it. Also, learn how to use a multimeter and just have a multimeter at hand. It's just easy for testing um, if there's power coming through circ certain circuitry and stuff like that. And make sure everything's turned off um, as you're wiring everything on. That's about all the advice I'm going to give you to this specific build because then I'm getting into tips and hints and this will go on forever. There'll be a specific video for that. Now on to my 10 day experience with how all this has worked out. I've recently come back from a 10 day trip or 10 days ago. So 10 days out in the bush, just got the vehicle ready before that trip by the way, that was to the Pilbara. And I've been back for about 10 days. So I've had the whole battery system in both constantly running, traveling, camping, and also at home, driveway, general life at home. So, with the front being two cranking batteries, I haven't noticed that much difference. Uh, it might just all be in my head, but it felt like the, the car started quicker with the starter motor. It could just be in my head, it probably is. Uh, the main thing, the back, 
Let's talk about the power. So my AGM battery, single battery, 105 amp hour battery is not, is not enough at the moment. Uh, I had unrealistic expectations with the solar panels. So having flat mounted solar panels, you're only going to get the sunlight for say four hours a day where you're going to get good amount of light because then the sun is directly above you. My panels are fixed, I can't tilt them. Um, as opposed to if you had a removable panel, you could face the sun all day and you can get way more uh, solar watts out of it. So both my panels are 80 watts each. If I put my hand, if I cast a shadow from my hand over the panel, that's enough to reduce the panel by 50% output. So it doesn't take much. So if you are in fact looking at installing a panel to your vehicle, don't put it under the roof rack like a lot of people do because you're going to get nothing out of it. Uh, and the only way you can sort of find out is if you have a smart unit like the Manager 30 because it tells you exactly how many watts are coming out of the panel. So when I stuck my hand over it, that's how I could tell it was reduced by half. I even threw a blanket over one whole panel and then I could see if they were both drawing the same amount or discharging the same amount of power, which they are. Another thing you need to factor in, when you park up at camp, you generally go for the shaded areas. So your solar panels are not going to be in the full sun anymore. So it's not charging again. And that's where it counts is when you're camping because you are at one place the whole time. When you're driving, it doesn't matter because it runs off the alternator, the car battery. So that is something I didn't really factor in. Uh, the next thing, well, the other reason why my single battery is not enough is because I have two fridges. Had I have one big fridge, it would be one compressor running, one current draw. There's two fridges. I don't regret having two fridges because the convenience of it is great, but the battery is not good enough. So, although it's an AGM battery, it charges way quicker than a lead acid, I think I might need to go for a lithium battery. Now, I could add a second AGM battery, which you guys are probably saying right now, why don't you just put two in there? Okay, well, an AGM battery is roughly 400 bucks or something like that for a good one. Well, that's what I pay for these, so maybe I got ripped off, maybe I didn't. If I put two in there, you're close to $1,000. $1,000 you can get a lithium battery for, maybe a little bit more actually. But your lithium battery you're going to get more out of as well. Uh, and it charges quicker, which is the main thing. Now, I could be wrong about this, but I'm pretty sure an hour running your engine, maybe even less, your battery will be charged up if it's a lithium battery. So, factor that in with solar power, it's going to charge a lot quicker. So that is probably what I'm going to do once I scrounge a bit of coin up. But I'm going to test it again on a trip coming up soon. So, that's pretty much it. Everything else has worked out good. The uh, inverter is the right size, I've figured out. Uh, but I, you must turn it off. If I don't turn it off and I leave it on, it draws current because it's still uh, converting, so to say. It's a small amount, but it adds up when your battery is, is not sufficient enough. Okay, thanks for watching. You can put your questions down below in the comments. There will probably be quite a few. Now, for the tips and advice video or tips and hints on all electrical stuff, soldering, wiring, just everything that goes with electrical, see this video down here, because that will help you take on a DIY job like this. Uh, please do support the creation of content here at patreon.com slash and you can subscribe up here. Thanks again. See ya.